Good evening. It's good to see you tonight. We're glad you're here. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a delight to be together. We're always thankful to uh, be among God's people, studying God's word and encouraging and edifying one another. And we're certainly glad that you're here tonight. Do you have your Bibles with you? Yes, no, maybe so. I see a few. All right, we're going to study the Bible. How good is that? Can't get much better than that on a Wednesday night. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's read the verse we've been assigned, trying to keep consistent with your theme tonight. We'll do that and develop the verse here. And then we'll, we'll be, first we'll get into an introduction. Uh, when the Bible is properly introduced and you get a good idea of the context that you're reading, you're really a long way down the road to understanding uh, the verses in question. Hebrews chapter 10, our specific verse, which I was given only one, I don't know if that was a joke, to just give a preacher one verse to talk about, so we'll have to talk about others, but that's a good place to start, so let's read that one together. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let's talk first of all about the context of the New Testament as well as the context of, that, of the book of Hebrews and that verse that we're reading. Maybe we would do well to try to understand the context. Let's go over to the book of Acts very quickly. We don't have time to read all of these verses. They, were, they gave me a lapel mic, so I trust you're recording this. And so at the end, when you're meeting at me at the back door and you say to me, you talk so fast, I couldn't keep up. And then I'll say, well, they recorded it, so you can maybe catch it that way. But we only got 40 minutes, 38 and a half now, so I got to keep moving. Acts chapter 4. You remember when the church started back in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says they had favor. Do you remember that? Acts 2? Yes, no? Maybe so? Okay, let's read it together then. Let's go back to Acts 2. I said Acts 4, but... Uh, are y'all going to stay with me and participate tonight or slow like that? Middle of the week, I know it's, it's on you. Okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. They were praising God and, catch the next phrase, having favor with all the people. And so the Lord's church started out on a great note. I, I, I mean, not only were the, 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 the people who obeyed the gospel, the disciples, not only were they enthused, but the people around them that saw their commitment to God, their love for one another. You remember, they sold their possessions and they were sharing with everyone as anybody had need. This had to look wonderfully impressive to the people around them and they had favor with those people. You should know that doesn't last, unfortunately. Because of the power of the gospel and its message, it didn't take long for it to run afoul of some of those same people. Peter and John healed the man in Acts chapter 3, and, and they healed him. He was at the gate of the temple. He went in leaping, rejoicing. Well, you can imagine, again, word spread about that. And in Acts chapter 4, have your Bibles, look at verse 1, verse 2. As they spake unto the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus, the resurrection of the dead. Now from here, you began to shape the context of the New Testament. In this same chapter, notice verse number four. About 4,000, by five, uh, the number of the men were about 5,000. Uh, verse number six and verse number seven, they called them before the council and they ask them, verse number seven, by what name or by what authority, what power are you doing these things? And Peter begins to preach Jesus. Jump over to verse number 16. The individuals go into council again and they say, what shall we do to these men for that indeed a notable miracle hath been done is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But that is spread no further, verse 17, let's threaten them. And they do. We threaten you with violence and physical force. Do not preach in this name anymore. What did the apostles do? They kept preaching. And so when we get to Acts chapter 5, because they kept preaching, they get called back in a second time. And this time, notice verse number 27. When they brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, 
and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, you know the apostles did not relent in any way. Peter and the others stood boldly. We ought to obey God rather than man. We can't help but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And they say again, that which they've been saying since Acts 2, you killed him, God raised him, we are witnesses. They keep saying that. They say it again here. By the end of Acts chapter 5, notice what happens. Acts chapter 5, verse number 40. To him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. We started with favor, Acts 2. We've moved to questioning, Acts 4, and threatening, and now we've moved to beating. What happens just two chapters from here? Stephen is, we've moved to killing, murder. This sets the setting for your New Testament. The saints who live in the New Testament won't know any other life in Christ but this. Acts to Revelation is written with saints suffering. We introduce the Saul of Tarsus, Acts 8, and what's he doing? Persecuting the saints. He's converted in Acts chapter 9 and he becomes persecuted, but he was before a blasphemer and injurious, and he did many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Acts 26, 9. By Acts chapter 12, James will be killed, Peter will be imprisoned, and this will continue. It will not get better, it will get worse. You should know that every book you read in the New Testament, if saints were sitting like we are here tonight, I doubt they would have been as calm as you are. I doubt they would have been as comfortable as you are. I doubt they would have been at ease as you are. No, they would have met and they would have gathered, but it would have been at great peril and they would have been watching as their neighbors and friends and families gave them up to the authorities. They would have watched. There might be people at the meeting tonight who wouldn't make the next one because they would have been caught and killed for Christ. This is the setting of the New Testament. This is the setting of the book of Hebrews. In fact, if you'll turn back to the book of Hebrews, just note a couple of the things that said in this book as those saints also receive and live in that same setting. Notice Hebrews chapter 2, some of the things they are exhorted. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast in every transgression and disobedience received of a just recompense and reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Don't neglect the salvation, brethren. You are now saved. Stay saved. Here in chapter 3, notice what he says in verse number 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the propagation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. What is the exhortation? As you could imagine, if there were those of us tonight being killed for the faith, some of us captured through the course of the week, we would hear tales of this person and that person in prison, losing their goods, losing their lives, losing their families. How many would make it next week? Might you find a reason not to meet at the meeting? Might you find a reason to maybe distance yourself? And is it possible, maybe just possible, that the pressures of your family, maybe a marriage, can you imagine if one of the people in a marriage was a Christian and the other one was not? Can you imagine the force and the weight behind that spouse's love for that person by saying, are you really going to continue this? Don't you see what it's doing to our family? What about the children? In fact, one of the things that the people who persecuted the saints early said is they would call them behind, in, into counsel and, and they would give them an opportunity to blaspheme the name of Jesus and worship the image. And if they would do that, then they would let them go. But if not, they would give them three chances. And if the third time they did not, then they were killed. Maybe they bring your family down. Maybe the wife that's not a Christian would plead to her husband, why don't you just give Jesus up? Just say you don't believe. Even if you do believe, just say you don't believe. Just bow down. I love you. I want our family to stay together. The children need a father. Just bow down. Do not continue this. That's the setting of the New Testament. So when you're reading these words of exhortation, you should have a good appreciation to whom they're being written and what these individuals are living through. 
Some of them, no doubt, were beginning to wane. Read books like Galatians. I marvel you are so soon removed. There were those who were beginning to lose sight and give up the Christ. Whosoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back, Jesus said. It was happening in real time. And so you hear exhortations like verse 12 of chapter 3. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Might they be tempted to give each other up? Might they be tempted to give Christ up? Absolutely. Notice chapter 10 of Hebrews in verse 33. Chapter 10, verse 33, he says, call to remembrance, verse 32, the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great trial of affliction, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. For ye, he had compassion on me and my bounds, took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. In chapter 12 and verse 4, he'll say, you have not resisted unto blood, but they would. And some had. Paul was imprisoned. He exhorted Timothy, don't be ashamed. This is the setting. Let's read the verse again and then let's talk about it. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. What do the words mean? The first one, hold fast. It means to restrain or hinder to check a ship's headway, to hold it steady, or to keep secure. And so hold fast, keep secure, keep firm possession of. Of what? Keep firm possession. The second phrase is hold fast, keep firm, hold secure the profession of our faith. The word profession has two ideas in it. Number one, it is professing someone. Obviously, that would be Jesus. You have professed Christ. Hold firm to that. But then secondly, it's professing beliefs. You profess the beliefs and the teachings of Christ. I not only believe in Jesus Christ, I believe in his teachings and I follow his doctrine. And so the exhortation is hold firm, keep secure the profession, your profession in Christ, your professing, profession in his teachings, and he says, Without wavering, not inclining, firm, unmoved, hold secure your profession in Jesus Christ and his teaching unmoved. It helps to know what they're up against when this exhortation is given. Hold fast, stay faithful. Be not conformed. Endure. That's why you read those exhortations in all of these epistles. Once we have begun a walk with God, the worst thing we can do is quit. The worst thing we can do is let God go. Because it doesn't matter for what we let him go, we will be trading the greater for the lesser. You can't give up God and improve. You can't give up God and do better. It doesn't matter what you trade God for. You're going down from there. You're going to lose. Trading or quitting God defies logic, betrays understanding, and gives in to inferiority. And yet, throughout the Bible, people have done it. In both covenants, in fact, this exhortation falls on deaf ears. In the Old Testament, Israel did it. Jeremiah 2, 10 through 13, they traded God. The fountain of living waters for cisterns, broken cisterns, which could hold no water. Judas did it, Matthew 27, 3 through 5. He betrayed innocent blood for what? 30 pieces of silver. Many disciples turned away. John chapter 6, verses 65 through 59. From that day, many of his disciples went no more with him. Jesus then turned to the apostles and he asked, will you also go away? Peter's words are worthy of noting. Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? That's the point. If you quit on God, to whom will you go? If you give up Jesus, to whom will you go? 
Paul says of Demas, he hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, 2 Timothy 4.10. Jesus said the church at Ephesus left their first love, Second Revelation 2, 4. And Peter said that false teachers came in and people followed them out. Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth is evil spoken of, Second Peter 2, 1 through 4. The first exhortation then is this, hold fast. Do not under any circumstances give up or quit on Jesus. What are you holding on to? The second thing identifies that to which they're holding. Hold fast to the profession of our faith. Every time someone obeys the gospel, they profess. They not simply confess, they, they profess. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They make that confession or profession. They, I believe in him. I believe his teaching. I believe his doctrine. If you're a Christian tonight, you did that. And so no matter what the world does, as these saints are suffering, the exhortation is hold fast to the profession. We have professed Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. We have professed him. Christianity, friends, is something that you and I actually have said to the world and by our actions, we believe. We believe in its author and we believe in its teachings. And we're committed to it. The Bible says hold on to it. What are we talking about when we use the word Christian? Christianity is the revelation of Jesus Christ revealed by God the Father through the agency of the Holy Spirit. You see, as you're reading these words, the Hebrew writer is not writing to people who have believed in being Pharisees. They didn't believe that. That's not what they professed. They didn't profess Sadduceeism. They didn't profess that. They didn't profess to be Herodians or Essenes or, or idolaters. or a, They didn't profess any of that. They're not holding on to that. They didn't profess, I believe in human wisdom. I, I, I want to be a stoic or a philosopher. Or an they didn't profess that. What they professed was Christianity. And Peter says, hold, or the author says, hold on to that profession. When we use the word Christianity, we're talking about the revelation that God gave through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, that he would guide them into all truth, John 16, 13. These are the words that they didn't speak themselves, but God spoke through them, Matthew 10, 16 to 20. The doctrine of Christ, Revelation 22, 18 and 19, from which we are not to add to or take away from. In fact, John says, 2 John 9 through 11, that if anybody brings any other doctrine, we're not even to receive them, nor bid them Godspeed. In fact, I have said to some individuals who knocked on my door teaching that Jesus was not the Son of God, not the divine second member of the Godhead, I've encouraged them, I hope you fail today. I certainly do not bid you Godspeed. I hope you fail in convincing anybody that Jesus is not the Son of God. For if they believe you, they'll lose their souls. It is the faith, Jude says, for which we are to contend earnestly. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. When the Hebrew writer says, hold on to your profession, he is talking about Christianity, the religion from God. The mind of God revealed, 1 Corinthians 2, 8 through 13. Christianity is not of man, it is God's religion. Scripture produces Christians. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. In fact, Paul professed before rulers that Christianity was not a sect, Acts 24, 14 and 15. And when before Agrippa, he says, I desire that all men would be Christians, Acts 26, 26 to 28. Peter, in writing to his audience in the midst of these trials and difficulty, the fiery trial which was to try them, Peter says, he needed to assure them we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power of God, 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18. But rather what he preached was prophecy from the Old Testament and inspiration by God, 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21. Christianity is the religion of the new covenant of Jesus Christ, the one for which Christ shed his blood, the one that buys our pardon, it's revealed in these 27 books in the New Testament. This is Christianity, the fulfillment of the Old Testament and the establishment of the New Covenant. 
Luke 24, 43 through 49. And because Christ is its fulfillment, he could take the old out of the way and nail it to his cross, Colossians 2, 14. This one of which Jesus is the mediator is based upon better promises, better offerings, and everything about this covenant is better, Hebrews 8, 1 through 13. The saints were called Christians, Acts eleven twenty six. 26. The new name that God gave, Isaiah 62, 1 and 2. James refers to it as, they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called. Christianity is pure religion, James 1, 27. And Peter said, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on that behalf, 1 Peter 4, 16. When the author says, hold on to your profession, he is saying you have become Christians. You have professed Jesus Christ. You have professed his teachings. And no matter what the world around you does, hold on to that without wavering. That's the third part of Hebrews 10, 23. The word means firm, unmoved. And that is the exhortation throughout the Bible for all of God's faithful people. In this very book, Hebrews chapter 10 ends with the exhortation that the just shall live by faith and we are not of them which draw back unto perdition. That's how Hebrews 10 ends. You know what it dovetails very nicely into is chapter 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What's that chapter full of? It's full of people who held on to their faith and did not waver. People like Noah, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 7. Yes, the saints are suffering. Yes, the saints are dying. Yes, the world around them is immoral and wicked and ungodly, but so is Noah's world. And Noah stands as a beacon of light of one who did not waver. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Noah didn't waver. But not only Noah, Lot is in, is in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, as having his righteous soul vexed from day to day by the wickedness of those around him. And then there's those three Hebrew boys, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, who stood before the image Nebuchadnezzar and the fiery furnace and said, we are not careful to answer thee. And if God does not deliver, he is able. But if he does not, know this, we will not bow. You know what that word could just as well be? We will not waver. We are holding on to God unmoved by your threats unmoved by your fire, and we will not bow to that image. Those men stood there unwavering. Someone like Joshua stands out, Joshua 24, 14, and 15. And may we tell the world around us, if it seem evil for you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me, as for me, now maybe, and thankfully, Joshua was able to say, as for me and my house, what if you can't? What if you can't say, and my house, for whatever reason, then don't lose the me. May we all save our families. Some people think Noah didn't succeed. He saved his family. You can't do much better than that. If you can get from here to heaven with your family, you've done well. God bless you. May we all do that. But if you can't, don't you lose out. Don't you miss out. Don't you waver for friends, for family, for finances, for freedom. Don't miss heaven for nothing. That's the exhortation. Now, you might get discouraged. Prophets did. They got discouraged. They didn't waver. They didn't relent. They didn't give up. Elders, gospel preachers, deacons, uh, Christians, you can get discouraged, but you don't have to give up. You might even get depressed. Elijah did. And sometimes the victories that we have are often followed by peaks or lows in the valley, which is not atypical, actually. It's hard to go up without coming down. Sometimes the lowest points of our lives are right after great victories in one way or another. 
Elijah ascended very high on Mount Carmel when he turned the nation back, defeated the prophets of Baal, chapter 18. But in chapter 19, we find him in a cave asking God, take my life. Well, you can be discouraged, but I know this, Elijah didn't waver. Elijah didn't give up on God. You might get discouraged. And then there's the world. They want us to waver. They want you to give up. And friends, you should know this. The world's influence is intense and severe. It was on them, it was on the saints in the Old Testament, and it is today. The world can so influence us. We can be at such ease that sometimes we forget literally what we're engaged in. Life can be so comfortable and so easy in the world around us, sometimes we don't even realize they're changing us. And so you hear exhortations like, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We can be conformed to this world. Christians are people who have been called out of the world into the kingdom of God's dear son. And that simple sentence says so much about our reality. Have you thought deeply in recent times about exactly what we believe as Christians? Maybe you should sit down and write out your beliefs and your professions, and it might astound you as to how counter they are to the world in which you live. Let me share just a few of them with you. Christians are people who believe in the God of heaven and earth, Acts 17, 24 through 31. The apostle Paul stood among idolatrous people and he said, God made the world. You believe that? How does that sit with our world? How does that sit with many in our world? We believe God has no equal, no rival to his majesty, his glory and honor. We believe that the Godhead consists of the Father, the Word and the Holy Spirit. And that the word was made flesh, born of a virgin, and died for the sins of the world. Matthew 1, 18 to 25, John 1, 14. We believe he is God with us. We believe Christ died, was buried, and rose again. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, according to the scriptures. Speaking of scriptures, Christians believe that the Holy Spirit empowered the apostles to write nothing less than the plenary, verbally, complete, and total inspired word of God. Amen. Christians believe that. Christians believe that Christ built one church, that the prophets prophesied about it, Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, Micah 4, 2, Joel 2, and that that fulfillment came on Acts 2. Christians believe that. And that in the writing and the promise of Christ, Matthew 16, 18, and 19, he promised his church. According to the scripture, then that church is the house of God, 1 Timothy 3, 15, and 16. It's the family of God, Ephesians 3, 15. It's the redeemed, purchased possession of God, Acts 20, 28. It's the eternal purpose of God, Ephesians 3, 9 through 11. It is the place where God is glorified and the only place God is glorified from, from, from beginning to end, world without end, amen, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. It's the place where all men are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ in one body, Ephesians 2, 11 through 16. The church is the body of Christ, that he is her head, her husband, and savior, Ephesians 1, 20 and 21, Ephesians 5, 22 through 25. Scripture affirm and we believe there is one body, one church. And therefore, Christians believe denominational division is sinful, contrary to the plan of God, contrary to the prayer of Christ, contrary to the revelation of the Holy Spirit, John 17, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 17. Christians believe that the gospel is how God saves all men everywhere and that anybody who will be saved will be saved through the gospel. Romans 1, 16 and 17, and without obedience to the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, no one can be saved. Christians believe that. We believe that God created the world in six literal days. Genesis chapter 1, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. Christians believe that human beings are made in the image of God. Which ones? Everybody. There are no subhumans. There are animals and then there are humans. And humans are made in the image of God. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We believe that. We therefore believe that life is sacred. Human life is sacred. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. Because humans share the image of God. And thus Christians believe that it's against God to, and sinful to murder human life. Proverbs 6, 16 and 17. Christians believe that to be true in the womb or out of the womb. 
Christians believe God is the absolute perfect good, that there is a standard of morality. It is the character of Almighty God, that the nature of God is infinite. His character is perfect and holy and just and good. And as John writes, God is light and in him is no darkness at all, 1 John 1, 5. Christians believe we can then, then therefore tell what is objectively right and what is objectively wrong. That there are things that are always wrong and there are things that are always right. Christians believe that. Christians don't believe in situational ethics. Christians believe Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And that there is no way to the Father except through him. And therefore any religion professing anybody else as access to the Father has to be wrong, John 14, 6. Christians believe that. Now listen to what the Hebrew writer says. Hold firm to the profession of your faith. Let me ask you this. If you were to go home tonight, write down these professions that you and I believe, what would your friends and neighbors say about some of these professions? What would your family say about some of these professions? And what might they try to do if you got into conversation with them? Light up Facebook posts with these things. Say to the world, I believe this because I hold it on to my profession of my faith. Christians believe God created humanity, male and female, Genesis 2, 18 to 25. Christians then of necessity must believe that a man, a male, and a female, a woman is supposed to be married and nobody else. One man, one woman for life. Christians believe that. Christians believe in heaven and hell as the eternal rewards and punishment of the righteous and wicked. Listen to what the Hebrew writer says. Hold firm to the profession of your faith without wavering. We cannot waver on these beliefs, friends. We must recall what we believe and why we believe it. We must even accept the implications of these beliefs. Given these beliefs, it's not difficult to see why the saints in the first century were having persecution and difficulty. Neither is it difficult to see why we will if we hold on to them. Thus, you hear words like this in the New Testament. Count up the cost, whether you have sufficient to build or finish. Be ready to suffer persecution, betrayal, and hurt. Be willing to lose friends and family and even possessions. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. What is the Hebrew writer saying and trying to exhort the saints to get to, friends? These are the things that he is talking about. Our world has been very clear, even lately here, that it is intent on not making this easy on us. And maybe it's been the case for so long that you and I have just enjoyed the great country in which we live, the freedoms that we enjoy, and it's been easy. You should know this as you're reading the New Testament. They don't live the life we're living. And what our world has done is tried to make it clear to us they intend for us to get much closer to this way of living than the nice, comfortable way we've been living. Friends, the truth of the matter is there simply must be opposition. There must be, and Christians must endure as long as truth remains truth, error must have a problem with it. And as long as error is error, truth must have a problem with it. It can't be any other way. You enter a dark room and cut on the light, I assure you this, if the light's working, the darkness doesn't stay. These are not that which can walk together. You and I are soldiers behind enemy lines. The field is the world. God never said leave it. Paul says we couldn't do that. And so we are to light it, salt it, maybe like leaven grow and spread within it, but we're not supposed to give up Christ for it. The revelation says be faithful unto death. James says count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Peter says think it not strange the fiery trial that is to try you. Paul urged if you live godly you're going to suffer persecution. Truth demands these things. We can't waver today, friends, any more than they could then. I'm going to run out of time before I run out of material, so let me step off of this thing and just talk to you very quickly about the last point. There's actually a final point in that verse. He says, hold firm to the profession of your faith without wavering, and then he gives a reason why. 
for he is faithful. That promised. Why do we live the life that we live? Why do we make the choices to forbear, to not engage in this, and to be willing to do this? Why give up a Wednesday night? Come here instead of do something else out there. Why come to every night of a gospel meeting if you're able? Why do that? Why come week in, week out on Sunday? Why turn from that? Don't watch that. Why not attend that? Why not go there when all the world around us is doing it and inviting us to engage in it? For he's faithful. That promised it. There are two things you should know about God and about faith. Number one, when it comes to the subject of faith, God is really desirous that you and I have faith and trust in him. In fact, if you want a good definition for the word faith, that would be it, trust. What are you trusting? Better yet, who are you trusting? You're trusting God, and you're trusting two things about God. Number one, you're trusting his character. Number two, you're trusting his nature. What that looks like is this. God's nature is infinite. And so God would ask Abraham and Sarah, is anything too hard for the Lord? Tell you what you do, get home tonight and write down something that's too hard for the Lord. Uh, the page should be blank. God's power is infinite. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. But that infinite power is meted out by a perfect character. And so God can do whatever he has promised, and God will do whatever he has promised. And what God has promised is the faithful go to heaven. That's God's promise. And from cover to cover of the Bible, that's what we see. God has never failed to keep any promise he has ever made. He is faithful. That's what the exhortation is. Why do you need to hold firm to your profession? Because he's faithful. If God has said it, then friends, it's true. God has said he, you go to heaven. Why remain faithful? Because God is faithful. God is going to take his faithful children to heaven. Don't let anything the world does around you convince you otherwise. There is nothing they have worth giving up heaven. It's also why verse 6 is in chapter 11. Without faith, it's impossible to please him because without faith, we're doubting one of those two things. He is, and he rewards those who seek him. Let's read the verse one more time. We'll have a close with a word of prayer. In light of all these things, let us imagine being in the first century receiving this letter. As you begin to read your way through it, you're nearing the end by chapter 10. And after all the exhortations, you get this one. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful, that promise. If our world should change further, Turn against us more violently. May we all remember tonight. May we all remember to commit ourselves to holding fast the profession of our faith without wavering because he's faithful. Would you pray with me? Our loving and eternal Father in heaven, we give glory and honor to your holy and righteous name. We praise you, Father, and we adore you for your majestic power, your infinite knowledge and wisdom and the expression of your mercy and love and sending your only begotten son to die for the sins of humanity. And Father, we are simply in awe of your love. Having become parents ourselves, we know the great love that parents have for their children. And so we can in some way relate and understand what it must be like to watch and have watched as yours was beaten and mocked, lied upon and spat upon, the crown of thorns pierced his flesh, and the beatings he endured, and not for his own sins, but for ours. And Father, we're so thankful for your love in sending him, for his love in going through the peril and pain for us. And we're especially thankful for the power of his resurrection and the victory that it provides over sin and death. And Father, we're thankful for each one who has made the profession that they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and submitted to your plan to be saved. 
And Father, if the world should grow worse and worse, as it did to the saints in the first century, we thank you for revealing your word that we might learn of them, see their example, hear the exhortations, and may we imbibe them, Father, and put them in our hearts, and no matter what the world around us does. And Father, we pray for strength, courage, and conviction to hold firm and fast to the profession of our faith without wavering. And we give you thanks, Father, for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen.